Welcome back to the uh, Survival and Basic Badass Podcast with Chuck and Kevin. So, Kevin, you ready to get started? I'm ready to get started. Now, All what's right. the show on today? Today, we're going to be talking about clandestine operations. All right. Now, what comes to mind when you're thinking clandestine? Spy, torture. CIA, torture. Really? Yeah. So, you're down for that, huh? That's what you think of when you hear it. I don't know. See, I don't know. I mean, I, I have thought about... Uh, my ability to withstand torture. Have you? Oh, it doesn't sound good. I'm going to waterboard myself later on today just to find you out. You know, I like to think I'm a good one with the pain and, and a little tolerance and put up with stuff, but I don't know. It, They've it, been perfecting it for you thousands wonder of years. Where, uh, you know how far it goes. You know, I've definitely uh, experimented, we'll yeah, say. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that, that's scary. No, actually, I think what comes to mind with me is you know, I think like James Bond or I think, uh, you know, you watch that show, uh, Covert Affairs or whatever. Well, you probably don't watch, I don't that, watch show, that show, but you know what I mean? Of the, the basic little spy craft. And I don't think that that's not really what I wanted to talk about. I okay. want to talk about what what governments are willing to do maybe behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, you know, that's or, where I'm or going. What uh, what needs to be kept a secret? Exactly. Um, the, I I think like you know I read that uh, there was a report and it said uh, clandestine is what's hidden versus like people think a covert is more what's deniable, and and that's what's different. So clandestine is more the doing things behind the scene without you being aware that they're being done. All right. So that that's really what I want to talk about. Now you had some uh, some different stories and different topics from different countries, did have, right? This have isn't some just theories. geared towards the United States. No, we're, we're not. We're not about right? United States bashing in general. We're you know willing to you know throw it around a little bit, mix up the pot. All right. So one of the things uh, you know, I was first excited. I was looking into Russia in the past, and I, I was reading this book, uh, Disinformation. All right. And. It would talk. It was talking all about Russia would recreate people's past in order to paint them in a certain light. Oh, so, I love that idea. That's, yeah, it that's really. Pretty smart. They would what they would do is they would go in and they would forge documents and create alliances and friendships based on a little bit of truth. They'd find out where this guy went and who he was and all about him. And then they'd be like, see, he was here in this town when this other guy was here. And they didn't mind stretching things a little bit. And they would actually were very big on forging and had whole, you know, sections and what was the, of the what was the goal of this of of doing these things? Well, it was really about turning people towards communism and painting Russia in a in a better light or the Soviet Union uh-huh. in a better light. And uh you know, they had a big problem with uh, the Pope and, and the Catholic Church during... Really? I didn't know that. The, the second, or, yeah, the second World War, uh-uh. where the Pope was really coming out against Russia because, you know, Russia took over those camps and mm-hmm. still kind of kept things going, and America kind of sat by while that happened after World War II. Hence the Iron Curtain, um, you know, East Germany, that whole, you know, some right. kind of... Right, So the Pope... Pius the Twelfth was speaking out against him and would talk about how you know hey these guys are getting out of control and you know that we need to look into this so they had to find a way to discredit the Pope. All right. Now they would do all kinds of crazy stuff, but they they would write plays. I don't know, like you know, like theater uh-huh. and kind of paint things in a light. So with Pius the Twelfth. He was actually very supportive of getting the Jews out and trying to help them out and look out for them. But they would try and paint it as the exact opposite. Mm-hmm. And as he was him being very empathetic. So what they did in order to create the illusion, they went in and it was actually the Romanians got together, you know, part of the Soviet bloc there. And in Romania, they said, you know, what we should do is we should go in and review the Vatican documents and see if we can find anything of the Pope's notes. And they call them the Vatican secret documents. But what it was was the personal papers of the Pope. Uh-huh. 
So they were like, oh, we want to go in and review them. And I think the best way to do it is what we'll do is we'll ask the, the uh, Vatican for a loan. So if we say, look, we really want to start to rebuild Catholicism in Romania. So what we want is like a billion dollar loan interest free. But also when we do that, wouldn't it be cool if we could review the Vatican documents and, you know, just showing good standing. Now, just a heads up. Is that something that that I could do? Get a billion dollar loan interest free? If you want to help spread the Catholic Church, it might be an option right, for I, you. I now, they were willing on, to work that. with the whole country. So, mm-hmm. you know, who knows? So what they did, they went in, they took a bunch of documents, they held on to them. Obviously, there was nothing that incriminated the Pope because he was down for helping the Jewish people. Problem was, they just send the papers back and they're like, all right, no problem. And they didn't say anything about it. Well, then what they did is they had a German playwright write a, uh, a, a play called The Sheriff. And it was all about a priest who went to the Pope and said, look, you know, these German, uh, these Jewish people are being persecuted and harassed and we need to do something to help them out. And in the play, the Pope would just say nothing. Now, what's cool about this is the Pope didn't say anything because it didn't happen. So it's really hard to deny something that didn't happen. You can't prove that. Right. Well, not easily. Not easily. And obviously you paint a picture. So they cited notes that they reviewed Vatican documents. And that's how they got a lot of this information. Also, they got a couple of unnamed sources in the Vatican, in the Swiss Guard, who were willing to you know, back this up and and say, yeah, you know, that did happen. I was down there for that. I saw that. So then in this play, after this priest goes to the Pope and he's like, yeah, we got to help these people. The uh, Pope, you know, like I said, says nothing and moves on. This guy ends up putting a Jewish star on his arm and is the great martyr and goes to the camps and he's trying to help people to their dying day. And throughout the play, they're showing the Pope In the Vatican, while outside, underneath his window, there's Jewish people getting rounded up and taken away. And he's up there living fat on the hog and unaware and oblivious and uncaring. And they basically tried to go with the whole Pontius Pilate type thing. Where, you know, I didn't make the decision, but you allowed it to happen. They clearly made religion out to be having a ne- negative impact on the people. They did, which is a big goal with Russia because well, it I think does in, conflict in, with communism. In, in most way. most socialist countries, religion cannot live side by side with with socialism. It has to be eradicated. You know, if you're going to run a, a socialist country, you can't have other strong influences that aren't the government. The government's your bread and butter. Everything that you know, everything that you love, everything that you need to survive comes from your government. It's provided by your father or mother. But, uh, you know, Catholicism offers that, um, that out, the, uh, the mercy and the, um, the giving to the poor, that sort of stuff. And, uh, you know, if you have another competitor for your affection, it's dangerous to your, to your country, to God, your ideology. God if, can get in the way of that. Yeah, no, it's, he's a big problem with socialism. So... And then the way they wrapped up this play was they gave a big speech to the priest and he's on his deathbed and whatever. And he gives a a plea where he says, you know, God can forgive maybe the people who get caught into this, but they certainly couldn't forgive a priest or forbid the Pope to allow such things to go on. And believe it or not, people really took a turn like, oh, you know, and they painted it as the Vatican would turn its head and let things happen so that Hitler would spare church buildings and, and the Vatican and, and not, you know, go after them. Right. And it was able to, you know, they I showed mean, a benefit Catholicism, to Catholicism really um, is what got Hitler elected as dictator. It was the, it was the, the, cut, the, um, the agreement between the Nazi party that they would vote for Hitler as dictator, as chancellor, as long as he agreed to not cause any problems, you know, with Catholicism. 
And uh, you could say that it shows a little bit of uh, lacking of backbone on the Catholic side. Well, they've had their ups and downs throughout the years, but I'll stay out of that argument. Uh, well, all right, for now. <laughs> for now, it'll come up later. Mm -hmm. We can count on that. All right, well, I also like to paint the picture that, you know, maybe we haven't always been that high and mighty in our No, do you think that there are certain things that we've done that no. were, could be perceived negatively? We're willing to cross some lines has been my experience. Um, I, you know, you have people out there like Noam Chomsky. I, I think you've read some of his books. Right. I don't know. I'm familiar with Noam Chomsky. Uh, you know, I, I, he's not exactly... He actually, uh, he is a big supporter of anarchy. Um, he is a big how, supporter. How anarchy could actually function in, in conjunction with civilization, I don't understand that. He's never described it. No, but he definitely brings some some uh, good points to the table. Uh, interesting thought experiments. He he does bring a lot to the table. Now let me I, let me ask yes. you let me ask you this about uh, um, clandestine services in yes. uh, Vietnam. Tell uh, me about. Do you Vietnam. think that the Vietnam War was? Who do you think the Vietnam War was won by? When in a sense, all of the factories and manufacturing in Vietnam was destroyed by the end of the war. I mean, are they are they a good showcase of socialism if they have no means of production? I mean, is that a, a clandestine plan or that's a, that's a Noam Chomsky idea is that the government, the US Tries government to only wanted to fail. yeah, only wanted communism to fail, not spread. Right. You know, if it fails, it won't spread. Right. No, no. I mean, that's definitely a solid argument you can make, but, you know, it's hard to say. There were so many forces at play there. It's hard to, you know, pinpoint what was the uh, the winner or loser in that game. Yeah. I know that we sure gave a lot of American boys there to really call us a winner in any stretch. Right. If you look at the American people. Now, if you're saying we're a winner by the American government, that might be a different story. But yeah, that's all left to be debated. We'll leave that to the college classes. All right. All right. So, Chomsky... Now, let me ask yes. you this. Uh, no, you're not going to let me talk. All back, right, yeah, I'm back down. Up to the, back up to the um, the uh, plays and, and the theater and uh, yes. all that. was. This is We're talking about Stalin Russia? Stalinist yes. Russia? All yes. right. All right. That's it? That was... Yeah, no, Stalin that clarified I, your Stalin is, uh, is, is, was definitely a, a brilliant tactician. He was. You know? Uh, obviously, the whole, you know, genocide of Jews, that's, you know, that's kind of a black mark. A black mark. A black well, mark Well, that's, that's for a lot socialism. of people don't realize that they kind of kept those camps going and were down for the right. whole thing after World War II. And we're like, oh, yeah, we'll just let that go on because... You know, we're really about done with fighting, and we don't want to mess with that anymore. Now, uh, I, I, that was only news to me in the last four or five years that right. I read well, a lot now, on now, that. Did you know that, that Germany had a, a large program? Jews, obviously, were at the top of the list. Uh, homosexuals, um, gypsies, uh, they, they... Oh, yeah. They murder, or they... I guess murdered is the right word. They murdered about... 20,000 schizophrenics in, well, in Nazi Germany. You got Nazi Ger or Germany now, now has the exact same population of schizophrenic uh, percent-wise as every other country in the world does. So they didn't stop it from spreading. So one thing, well, one thing we learned is that schizophrenic is not necessarily genetic. Sounds that way. It's, I mean, if it is genetic, it's genetic. It's lying in every person. Now that's, I mean, you know, that was one of the things. I mean, I don't know if it was that I didn't pay attention in school, but I never, I somehow, even though I'm in school in the 80s and early 90s, I didn't get any of that whole Eastern Bloc, Russia controlling all that stuff, East Germany being Russian controlled. And right. I mean, I guess I knew that it was Russian controlled, but... I don't know really how but Europe the was really grasped that at the end Russia of World War Two. Europe was really divided up into into and, separate parts. Like uh, Russia got some, the United States got some of Europe, right? England got some of Europe, 
And we don't really talk about that. I, but that's, I feel like it got that's missed where our in history intelligence class, agency. at least for me. I don't know if I was sleeping that day. Yeah. Maybe the one teacher I had. But that really just blew my mind, you know, the more I read about that and Russia's tight control. And I had no idea they were running camps and still torturing people after, you know, after the Second World War. Right. Russia's happy to, you know, Russia was happy to be allies with Germany until Hitler went and betrayed them. You know, mm -hmm. until that happened, they were like, yeah. And it was funny because speaking of propaganda, they originally started getting, Stalin started getting reports that Hitler was going to overthrow and turn, you know, against Russia and overthrow them. And he kept saying, oh, that's just disinformation. Don't believe it. And his spies kept coming back and saying, no, Hitler's going to turn on you. This is going to end badly. And he was actually having his people reported killed for saying that. And he was like, no, that can't be true. You know, Hitler's yeah. got our back. We made an agreement. We signed papers. We shook hands. And then it ended up. Yeah, well, you know, there's certain people you can't trust no, and, in the world. The Nazis are one of them. You know, that's always been my fear of doing drugs is turns out you got to buy drugs from drug dealers. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> That's that's one yeah, of the you necessary. Can't, don't ever trust a drug dealer. Don't ever trust a drug. You know. Yeah, you gotta you gotta choose your friends it, wisely. Yeah, no, it was, it was Hunter Thompson world. that said you can trust a friend. You can turn your back on a friend, but never turn your back on a drug. Is that right? That's right. If your friends do a mescaline, be wary. Yeah. Don't go to sleep. <laughs> and we'll take that under advisement. So back to, well, do you have anything more? You're good. No. You're, you're caught up. Yeah. No. I, I don't want to. I don't I'm just, I'm just riding the wave. All right. So, Noam Chomsky, I actually, again, not somebody I agree with politically, but what I like about Noam Chomsky, and again, in no way do I accept what he says as complete fact, and everything is with a grain of salt, and that's like listening to people on a podcast. You don't want to just assume they know yeah. what they're talking about. Definitely you wanna, don't assume that you know, with me. And I don't assume that with Noam Chomsky, but... The one thing I really can give the guy respect for is, even though he's a communist and he's crazy, he's open about it. And right. at least 10 years ago when I was reading his stuff, nobody else was willing to admit, oh, I'm a communist, oh, I'm a socialist. He was outright, you know what, this is a better plan than what America Get your doing. ideology straight, though. He's not a communist. He's down for communism. He's, he, me. Su he supports communism more than capitalism. Capitalism is the great evil to him. And that's some place where we come to an impasse. I can never agree with him But when he talks about Russia... But he supports Russia more system, than the United States. But he's, he's an anarchist. I've heard many a core. lecture where he's like, Russia has a way better system than we do. Yeah. I, and I respect, I, I just want to put it out there that I respect Noam Chomsky for his uh, in intellectualism. And I respect that he's proud of who he is and what he believes in. And he's in. honest about it. And he is in his 80s or 90s now. He's but I would still there. punch him in the face if I met him. You would? I would. All right. As long as we're, we're being honest. Yeah. I mean, that's really where we want to draw the line with honesty. I'd go to jail to punch Noam Chomsky. <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing is he's like totally out of alignment with what I believe. But I'm like, you know what? At least the guy says what he wants. If you think America sucks, then at least you're honest. Right. I hate all these politicians who are up there and are like, yeah, we should do all these things that are completely opposite of American values. Right. But then they now want me, to say, but I'm me, an awesome American. Let me you ask you like a, me. a question real quick to interject. Why are you patriotic? Why am I Why, patriotic? Because I, I was thinking about this the other day. And, you know, I have a friend of mine that's that's a very um, avid Jets fan. Tell and I, I understand, like, you know, rooting for the home team. But I don't understand the, you know, because most of those players aren't from New York, you know. Most of those players came from different parts of the country. You, why, why are you pro where you're from? And and is it is it because you were raised having the values that your country has or is it because you have a, a certain pride in your your fellow Americans and in their capabilities is it a is it a pride in the sense that we as a country invented the first 
truly free government because our government is based on the laws of nature in a sense free trade capitalism is how the market functions when it's not influenced right it's always influenced but the ideas are founded right. by by intellectual giants in the sense that the more freedom you give a man the more he's capable of and i think that kind of describes my patriotism patriotism but that's it seems like somebody's chipping away at that those ideals those american they're ideals they're definitely right chipping away so uh I mean, that's kind of my stance on, on patriotism is that right. I love my so country, but I fear my government. So what you're saying is you government. asked me a question and then you answered it for me. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right I'm good with that. Why are you a patriot? <laughs> oh, now, now I got nothing. You got yeah. nothing. I can't say that. Do you love now. your country? Would you defend your country and to your death? Well, I think I did, right? Did I not? You I don't did. know about to the death because I'm still here. You're still around. Doing a podcast, but... Yeah. Uh, just the same. I were was happy willing? to step up when no, it's time. Were, were you willing up? when you were a young man? But I gotta say, yes, obviously. I was. Be, being I was the also. proud warrior that I was, but just the same, less and less. You know, I know when um, one of the uh, skirmishes that my uh, my ship was involved in, we uh, we had a lot of stuff where we would serve under the United Nations. And that was one of actually the deterrents to get me getting out was we served under commanders who were not necessarily in alignment with what I believe are American American values. values. And, you know, maybe somehow, you know, you you take an oath to support and defend the Constitution. You don't take an oath to defend whatever the hell they feel like. And and when you you took that oath to defend and support and defend the Constitution... Did you take that as meaning an oath to defend your standing government or the Constitution? Because I took that as defending the Constitution, and See, that's something I fully support. I, w- I am with you on that. that. I would have to agree with me, you on that. And that was one of the things was I did see where, you know, one of the big things, and I know it's come into play lately and different things, but you see, uh, you know, you always hear about the SEALs and things like that, and they would... um. They would always, you know, they, they have your back. And that's why you're willing to fight one to the death. But you fight as hard as you do because you know no matter what happens, they're going to have your back and try and take care of you. Right. And, and at least that's the philosophy the good-hearted American believes. Whether, you know, that's really how it comes down, I don't know. But that's what you want to believe is true. Mm-hmm. And I know we had special forces guys and we were over there when we were doing uh, stuff in undisclosed locations. And we were serving for the United Nations. We had our guys out there. They got surrounded by 100 bad people. And two or three were on the inside. And the rest of the guys were on the outside. And the UN commander was like, screw that, we're out of here. Yeah. And we just left the guys there, and I'm we're somewhat, like, oh, I'm somewhat familiar with that, the that what sucks you're talking to be about. You. Yeah, and I'm somewhat familiar with what you're talking about. Several things like that play out, right? And I mean, I saw that play out firsthand. Well, that's that's one thing that I am I'm never going to be able to vote for Hillary Clinton in that whole <laughs> situation in in Benghazi, and that's something that I can't support as being American. Did you see that it came out as a fact now that we were doing gun running and we were all about hiding that? I fully believe that and I fully support that. Right, right, that's fine. I do. But we were trying to cover it up is why we didn't want to help that guy. Right, and that's what's messed up. Because you're like, oh, well, you know. That's what's inappropriate with the actions People might figure out that they're there because we were smuggling guns and doing things and then that might embarrass us and look bad. So screw that guy and just leave him there. Yeah. And yeah, that's what And you know, I I, I would like to... uh, know a little bit more we're not going to be able to because everything's classified but i'd like to know a lot a lot more about what happened inside that building and outside that building in the in the hours following the whole uh the whole situation i'm not going to get involved with it because i know a lot of things that might have happened but i'm not going to talk about any specifics because i don't know about it enough and i don't think any of us ever will and that's something that and that's going to keep thing. me from CIA voting for guys Clinton. sitting off site waiting and, you know, they're 
American heroes who love America and they join for a reason. I'm sure they're bad apples like we saw in the military. You know, we're not right. all great people. It's a mix of the population. But I imagine people who seek out the CIA are, are probably pretty patriotic. awesome guys. Yeah, they're very I would patriotic imagine. people. I've met a, a few of them. They're very weird. I've met they're some weirdos, of them, but, you know, yeah. But they're, they're, their beliefs can't be questioned generally. It's been my experience. And, yeah, it's hard to believe that, you know, a situation like that we'd allow to play out. Now, back to uh, Noam Chomsky. You'll okay. let me go here now. I don't yeah. want to, you know, interrupt things. All right. So Noam Chomsky, like I said, he, you know, comes from different places. But the idea is at least he's truthful and he, you know, with what he believes. You know, he believes to be true. I don't know all the documents that he gets. I don't know where they get. He gets them. Right. But I don't know. Anyway, that said, moving along. Anyway, the other stuff, I was reading uh, some stuff and talking to some people who were uh, in South America. And we definitely have a sordid past of influence and stuff in South America throughout the years. And I guess that's, you know, I, I just, the more I learn about it, the more I'm shocked that, you know, what we're willing to do to change a political outcome. And, you know... It's weird because a lot of the time we weren't even looking for a capitalist or democratic outcome. And when countries would tend to veer towards capitalism, a lot of times we would go back to the dictator we knew we could control or manipulate. Right. And that I find disturbing because it seems contrary to American values. Well, you know, it, there's I think there's a, a, a large amount of... Uh, Greed when you're in a place that you can take a suitcase with fifty million dollars to somebody, you yeah. know, when you have that amount of influence on somebody and you have that uh, ability, I think that gives you kind of a uh, a big head, you know. Yeah, and um, you know, I think I think if you can control the outcome of immediate situa of an immediate situation by dropping money that isn't yours off to somebody that you disagree with that's going to help with your outcome, there's a big draw to that, that sort of easy fix. And that's true. I, I think that's right. And a lot of that money came from drug cartels. I know we were discussing earlier in right. other conversations. But, yeah, uh -huh. you know, that's that's definitely something that... Uh, so what I was looking at, I mean, they were there were a couple of points that, you know, I was reading in these these manuals on our operations in CIA and, and like that. And they talk about, it said a guerrilla unit in a rural town does not want to give the impression that their guns are their strength over the people, but rather the guns are the strength of the people. And so you try and create an atmosphere when you're embedded and they were just right in there with the general population and they would do things like they would hang their weapons or just leave them about to kind of set that casual atmosphere and be like, oh, I'm not here to oppress you. Right. I'm, I'm not the threatening you. force. I'm part of you. And it was also, you know, it was always about winning hearts and minds and really doing that and manipulating a situation. And it's just unusual to me. They would actually take the young men in the, the area and, and take them out and teach them how to shoot, teach them how to clean and, and work with the weapons and build up a confidence that we're all part of a team and it's all about you know building up that alliance with the people. And the people should feel that the weapons are there to help them against oppression rather than, you know, and it just, it amazes me the more I learn and the more I read about it, I'm just like, whoa, you know, we really, um, you know, we really are willing to cross a lot of lines of how we do things. A gun has a, a large psychological impact. It does. And, um, you know, using using firearms and being around people to use far, firearms, you learn to understand that quick. The psychological impact of an armed person threatening you or being your friend yeah 
has a large impact on how your mind operates. It definitely empowers you or empowers mm-hmm. the people around you and, and changes the outcome. Um, we're very big on going in and it was weird. What you do is everybody, the, the guys down there in South America, Guatemala, these different places, they would basically set up groups and meetings and get involved and find the right people, you know, who are able to influence a lot of people. They said it was important to be able to um, influence a large number of people rather than a large amount of land. You know, the more minds you could win, the more, you know, control you had over an area. And the idea is you could have just one CIA guy with, a bunch of locals and you could kind of control and dictate how that moves and by building the confidence and talk to them. And like some of the things that, you know, really surprised me was they were down for like assassinations happening and you could kind of hint and suggest at these type of things and allow them to happen without a, uh, allow that to happen without really any, you know, confrontation from our government, which disturbs me a little bit. I got to tell you. Well, I mean, it it shows what, what one well-trained, motivated person can do. And it is in a way mind control, you know, it just really, now, I mean, the stuff that I read was about, well, you want to take somebody who they already hate and despise, somebody they want to see go on, And you're not going to necessarily suggest it, but you're going to allow it to happen and motivate it in the right direction as long as you can control the outcome. Mm -hmm. And who replaces that guy? And is that somebody we can control? Now, let me ask you this. Do you think that's wrong? Do you think that's wrong to behave that way for your country? I mean, do you think it would be wrong to um, arm Kurdish forces? to arm Kurdish forces. It's not in a way, I just think people should be aware and it doesn't, I mean, obviously the general population, if everybody thinks like this and is aware of this, then it makes America look bad and also it loses its effect. It doesn't Mm -hmm. have any value. You can't manipulate things if people expect them to be manipulated. And I guess that's kind of a big part of why I wanted to do this talk today was... I don't want you to be manipulated. Just be aware of what's happening and make sure your decisions are your own and mm-hmm. where you're going. Now and kind of where do you get your um, general general day to day news sources? Are do you do you watch TV? Do you watch cable? I, I listen to AM radio, so I am hearing you know your local news and yeah. whatever with that way. And I think that's I, uh, probably the most you know influential. I, I don't really read the papers. I, I don't watch much cable news. I watch the debates. I watch whatever. I, I did... Um, Even that... Every now and then so. I'll pick up, uh, you know, the New York Post and, uh, you know, the different newspapers we they're have in, in the the, uh, the area here. Yes. And uh, they're not they're not informing me on news, though. Yeah, That's not where I'm going to get my don't information get facts, on the world. No. no. No, and it's really difficult to seek out actual information when it comes to foreign affairs you know you really have to look for it so i i i do a lot of my uh news i kind of go through the channels cnn and fox and msnbc and then kind of uh coordinate that with different sources from the internet uh i just completely disregard the newspaper anymore because it's all sensationalism but i mean i in a sense that's what fox and cnn are too they do. You know? But, I mean, you, you have to be very careful where you're getting your information if you want facts instead of opinion. Well, I, I mean, think, opinion is something that you should make yourself based on facts. I'm with you. I'm with you on that. But, it, it, like you said, it's hard to weed through. And, I mean, I think even if somebody is not trying to influence a discussion, right, it's still going to be in there. I mean, I think mm-hmm. even if I portray a story to you, I'm gonna, There's going to be an influence. I'm going to tell you vice versa. what's important to me. Right. Whereas that may leave out something. I know with my wife, I always we see things differently eye to eye, and she's always like, "Well, what about this? Did you consider that?" And yeah. Whatever, and I'm like, "Oh no, that has no bearing. Don't even, you know." Mm-hmm. And in my mind, it doesn't. 
but that right. doesn't mean I'm all knowing. You know, I think that's even in a marriage, how people work is you have the, you know, the wife in theory is bringing sensitivity and compassion, whereas the man is the bringing the quick decision, the hard, you know, end of it. Mm -hmm. And the balance of the two is what make you, right. you know, I'm, a good I'm person. I'm in, in several senses a, a misogynist, you know, I... I, I I am aware. I'm a very, very pro man. You are pro man, but I'm pro man in you the things that. You did have a what, he man woman hater sign in the bunker, didn't you? Yeah, that's on the outside door now. On so the that outside they know door, not secret in. knock. And but yeah. yeah, there's a secret knock. I'm not gonna knock it out right now because it's secret. But uh, what I'm getting to is, is there are definitely things that women are better at than men are. And one of those things is bringing a perspective of compassion into a lot of discussions I have that I don't, I wouldn't normally bring it into. Now, even though there's some profanity here, I just had to hold something back just so you know. All right, all right, all right. But um, I think I think the the point of what I'm saying is that there is an inherent value in any heartfelt opinion. And I'm definitely interested in listening to anybody's opinion, but my opinions are my own, and they're they're based on facts. They're based on feelings, you know, and mostly facts because I'm a man. And I don't have feelings. <laughs> exactly. You know, well, but that's it's, good have, it's good to have an outside. Definitely influence. has been my experience that people, you know, men are that make decisions on facts, and mm -hmm. and you know. Other people make decisions on emotions. All I know, know is when I don't when know it goes down, true. there's. A, the, I think it's good. It's and it's healthy in a in a in a household. Yes, to have a peacetime general right. and a wartime general. And you're willing to say that the man is the right when I come home. Which general is the when man? I come home and she's got the dishes but washed and laundry done? <laughs> she's running the house. Okay, but when what? there's not enough money to cover the bills. Or the car's broken down, that's on me. That's on you. You know? So you're saying if the woman's like, oh, let's spend all our money and do it on all this crazy stuff, and then retirement comes and all the money's gone. Right. You that's living, your fault. That's your fault. That falls on you. Yeah. Okay. Because there's a man. It's your obligation to provide you for your the house. longevity and the survival of your, your family and your, your children. And, I mean, listen, who doesn't want their name carried on That has more than one generation, experience. you know? Now, that all said, I think we've gone uh, pretty far here. I don't know. We've gone. I, I had more information, more things I could drop on you, but I'm willing to say we that do a we part maybe, two? maybe we will Let's revisit do a part two this episode. later on. That sounds good. So I think we've gone about as far as people want to listen. They don't want to get too tired. So uh, that said. All right. I'd, I'd urge the listeners, though, to do a little bit of research on the Spanish-American War. Uh -huh. Because that had a large impact on South America and and United States relations, and because they speak Spanish. And in if South you're interested America, right? in, if you're interested in general badassery, yes, that war, full. Teddy Roosevelt, the Rough Riders, San Juan Hill, uh, a lot of great naval victories. Also, right. um, speaking of, we do have to get back to having badasses. Right, right, and uh, you know if you want to get down to it. Um, and you want to find a few great American heroes that you've overlooked, do some research on the Spanish-American War because it is full, full of, of amazing feats of daring. So with that, you can check out notes on this and more information at PreppingBadass.com. And uh, otherwise, enjoy your week, and uh, we will see you next time. All right. Stay badass. Mm -hmm.